All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by uh, Julie, um, Julie, Julianne, Giulioni, who is actually also in Southern California up in the Pasadena area. How are you doing, Julie? I'm really well, thank you, John. Excellent. And Julie helps organization enhance learning, engagement, retention, and the bottom line with her consulting company, Des Design Arounds. Uh, and today what we're going to talk about is building, building leaders who build other leaders. Or, um, and so, um, Julie, let's talk about uh, immediately, like, what's the difference between a leader who just leads and a leader who grows others? Oh, it's pretty um, fundamental. To me, the idea of leadership really is developing those around you to bring greater capacity, greater potential, greater um, skills, greater energy to uh, the work. So a leader who's growing others is a leader who can grow him or herself, who can grow the business. So that's kind of a distinction in my own mm -hmm. mind. And that's interesting that you say is, um, you know, somebody who doesn't invest in themselves and in their own growth, obviously, they can't then help other people grow because they don't understand the fundamentals of what's involved. Yeah, yeah, it's, it all begins with modeling, right? People mm -hmm. are looking at their leaders and picking up on all sorts of cues. And a leader who is obviously investing in his or her own development is going to inspire the same uh, on the part of others. And I think that's a really important point about modeling, because I don't think people always fully understand the concept of modeling. And we live in a world today where people just like to shout at each other and tell each other what they think they should do with their lives, not realizing that the reality is that we, we follow and are more interested in how people behave and comport themselves and what they do. And when we see somebody who looks like they're well adjusted and as you said, investing in themselves and inquisitive and listens to everything and all of that, then you're more likely to go, Hmm, that's an interesting way of, of behaving. Maybe I should do that. So true. I remember as a young parent, I came across a quote that has just stuck with me today. It's equally appropriate in the workplace. We, teach the life we live mm -hmm. and as a parent how we behave just exudes throughout the family and informs uh young people how how life works and how they're supposed to behave in the workplace leaders every day the uh the way they show up teaches others about what good leadership self-management collaboration influence whatever it might be so that whole thing, you know, do as I say, not as I do, doesn't, yeah. doesn't hold much water. So what are some of the ways that uh, those kind of leaders can then start to, I mean, modeling is one thing, but then how can they start to proactively um, start to grow the people in their organization? And, and let's face it, I mean, people grow at different speeds, people have different talents. And I think most importantly, people need, need to be communicated with differently depending on who they are. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. One size clearly doesn't fit all mm -hmm. when it comes to leadership in general and certainly development in particular. You know, um, what I've found over the last 20 or so years of field research is development really comes down to sort of two intersecting priorities. On the one hand, there's this whole activity around cultivating conversation. And then the other side, other piece of the puzzle that kind of fits together in there is engineering experiences. And so the most effective developers that I've seen are the ones who understand that development is a relationship, a relationship that really plays out in large part through dialogue, through conversation. Mm -hmm. And so having that running conversation about how folks are doing, what they're needing, how they're growing, what they're learning, you know, not having it be kind of that once a year, let's sit down and plot out what your development plan is going to be, um, and then not look at it again until next year mm -hmm. this time. Having that ongoing, cultivating that kind of ongoing conversation is key. And then you have a basis at that point to co-create or co-engineer experiences that give folks an opportunity to test, experiment, expand, 
do what they need to be able to uh, to grow their capacity and skills. Yeah, I mean, I love that. There's a, there's a couple of great points in the, in there, um, especially what you're saying about this ongoing uh, kind of interest in how people are progressing and that ongoing dialogue. Yeah, I've never been a fan of the of the once a year you know, review yeah. meeting. Um, because I think if you're a good leader or even a good manager for that matter, you should be, you sh it should be a continuous review and it should be continuously helping and progressing the person forward, as you say, through dialogue, et cetera, not, mm -hmm. not waiting for that once a year where you sit down and then everybody kind of stares at each other and goes, where's that piece of paper that, right. <laughs> um, right. and, um, and so it, it's in, it's interesting then how do you how are some of the ways then when you see somebody who perhaps has got a lot of potential but for some reason isn't growing at the speed or that you think they should be how, how do you deal or reach out and help those kind of people well it's interesting cuz that little clause that you added the speed you think they should be maybe where the question comes in because mm -hmm. as leaders we've got these pictures of where people should be and what they should be doing and everything that they you know are capable of and yet it doesn't always sync up to the vision that the employee might have so i think mm -hmm. probably one of the foundational things that we have to do is really figure out where is the employee coming from what are they interested in what do they want to learn how do they want to contribute and then we can calibrate differently. If they want to um, be in a different place, have a different skill set, be able to contribute at a different level, if that's been established and they're not there, then that's a delta worth mining. And mm -hmm. at that point, then, you know, it's a matter of digging in and saying, you know, hey, I know you want this and it's not happening. What's getting in the way? You know, what can we do? What else needs to happen? How can I help? Yeah, because I mean, it is an interesting and I think that's a great point, um, a great point that you picked up on. Yes, it's always um, kind of frustrating when we think when we think that people have greater capacity or maybe they do have greater capacity, but they're not moving at the speed that we would like. It requires us obviously to do some digging there, because as you say, maybe they're not ready for it. Maybe, they're, maybe there's other stuff going on that's holding them back. Who, who, who knows? Um, until you ask, obviously. Um, and, and then the other part is is maybe you know, creating that environment where somebody feels that they can actually have that conversation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that is a lot of it. And that kind of goes back to what I said before about it being a relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, an effective leader is one, uh, an effective developer of others is one who has built a solid foundation of trust and where there's a give and a take, and there's respect that's uh, extended in both directions. And that kind of an environment is the one where people can step in and say, I don't know how to do this, or I'm really struggling with this, or I need help. It's a, that kind of an environment that opens the door to the vulnerability that really comes with developing, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and the other part of it, though, is that, uh, you know, I'm always at pains to make sure that people don't think that this is a one way street either, is that because because I always think that it's um, you know, the people who sit back and wait, wait for their company to train them, wait for their company to develop them. Um, let's face it, you're more likely to invest the time and effort with somebody who you see has already started investing the time and effort with themselves. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you know, I mean, we've said for years, employees need to own their careers right. and their yeah. career development. Nobody's going to care as much about my career as I do, or maybe my mom. Um, yeah. And um, so employees have to own their career and take the initiative and set the pace and set the direction. And yet managers haven't worked themselves out of a job. You know, there still mm. is a role for leaders and managers sure. to support and guide and facilitate and enable. Um, but you're right. It's a lot more fun to help somebody who's really, you know, invested develop themselves. And and to be honest, I mean, you're more likely to in, you're more likely to go above and beyond and invest more in that person because you think, okay, well, you know, they're already ahead of the game. This is an enthusiastic person, as opposed to as we said a moment ago. I mean, if you think somebody is maybe not progressing, and yeah, you may still be able to bring them forward, but you may, you know, human nature being, you may be less inclined to spend as much time with them as you would be with the person who's looks like they're hungry. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's easy to, to follow the energy, isn't it? it mm -hmm. Energy attracts energy. Yeah. And so um, what, what are some other things that leaders can do to really, you know, make sure that they have that continuous improvement or that they have that culture of continuous improvement in their organization? Um, two things, really. Uh, one is to cultivate curiosity and the other is a cue sensitivity. So mm -hmm. leaders who are genuinely, authentically curious, inquisitive, who want to understand where folks are coming from and what's making them tick and what's working and what's not and you know who who approach the conversation in a non-judgmental but really open receptive and curious way are engineering the kind of environment that you know is is, is ripe for development it also back to the modeling it also models the kind of curiosity that can help employees grow and then the other uh, piece of it is the cue sensitivity. The most effective leaders I know are the ones who are able to read the room as it is. Um, it's the, the folks who are able to take these small cues, pick up on just these tiny signals that might just kind of pass over everyone else and be able to double click on those and find mm -hmm. out what's going on. You know, uh, just a, a passing phrase, you know, gosh, I'm really tired of doing that kind of work. Right. Might just let it go, figure, you know, not worth my time. But to be able to say, hmm, let's talk about that for a minute. What don't you like about that? Which mm -hmm. part of the job is more in, interesting and engaging for you? How could we shift some of your workload and energy in that direction? You know, just a small throwaway line can be the, the door that is open to a really powerful dialogue. And that may be exactly what lights a fire under that person who's not moving along so fast. Yeah, absolutely. No, I love that idea about uh, curiosity, because I do think that uh, for some reason we live in a, in a I was say in a world today with losing our sense of curiosity because we've become very lazy with just you know taking sound bites out of everything and social media and everything is in bite size and we don't really and i think the curiosity of really you know wanting to go a little bit deeper i think that can really make you stand out yeah you know i was talking to my daughter um the other day and when i was younger you know until maybe 10 or 12 years mm -hmm. ago um we could wonder about stuff you know, mm -hmm. I, well, I wonder, fill in the blank. And now you just pull out your phone. There's yeah. no wondering. We'll just Google that. Um, yep. And it does. I think it does extinguish some of the curiosity. And so we've got to work pretty hard, I think, as leaders to be able to keep that flowing. And when we do, then I, I, I really do believe that it can trigger it in others as well. Yeah, and the other point, as you said, about the, the sensitivity piece of being able to pick up on things, that doesn't mean that, because I think sometimes people get the wrong idea when you say sensitivity, that doesn't mean like, you know, you have to be soft about everything, because sometimes when you pick up on something, it means, you know, something, I do need to light a fire under people, yeah. or I do need to have people step up a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that's the other part is if you if you trust, if, you, if the leader has gained trust, then he has, he or she um, has earned the right for moments to get tough with people. Yeah, yeah. And you know, the truth is, people really resonate um, with that kind of authentic information that someone is willing to share with them. You know, it, it mm -hmm. takes courage to share those tough messages. And um, it's especially, actually, the research suggests that top performers really prefer those hard messages and constructive feedback about what they can improve, even over just, you know, the recognition, the feel good mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, and no, I, I, I would agree with that. I, I believe that too, because I think they're looking for, they're looking to be pushed. It's like, it's like if you go, I don't know, whatever sport you're into or whatever, but if you go and you've got your coach and your trainer there, if he's always just going, oh, that's good, just good, pat you on the back, oh, well done, yeah, good effort, good effort. That's not really what you want. You want them to push you just that little bit beyond where you think you're capable. Right, right. And provide the support Yeah. to help you get there. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. Well, listen, this has been great, uh, Julie. Um, all of Julie's information will be in the contributor bio below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Oh, I'm a, a writer and speaker and trainer and consultant um, in the leadership and career development space. 
and uh, I can be reached um, at my website that you'll have in the, the show notes. Oh, absolutely. And I think, I mean, you say I'm a writer. You have sold how many books? I mean, because it's quite incredible, uh, the numbers of books oh, you've sold. So sweet of you to, to say 120,000 of uh, our first book. And I just signed a contract for the second book that I'll be writing. Well, that's fantastic. And just to give people some context sometimes, you know, with business, but you know, business books or, or books like this. I mean, most people are lucky if they sell two to 3000 in a lifetime of a book. So, you know, 120,000 is quite spectacular. So I would uh, uh, really encourage you to go and check that out. Um, listen, Julie, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me today. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeline of CRM. See you all again soon.